Buttercup was raised on a small farm in the country of Florin. Our favorite pastimes were riding a horse and tormenting the farm boy that worked there. His name was Wesley, but she never called him that. Nothing gave Buttercup as much pleasure as ordering Wesley around. Farm boy, polish my horse's saddle. I want to see my face shining in it by morning. As you wish. As you wish was all he ever said to me. Farm boy, fill these with water. Please. As you wish. That day, she was amazed to discover that when he was saying, as you wish, what he meant was, I love you. And even more amazing was the day she realized she truly loved him back. Farm boy. Fetch me that picture. of the series, I know so often when people are sort of ending a relationship, they'll say something very similar. They'll say, uh, it's not you, it's me. Uh, so this series is titled, It's Not Me, It's You, which may be what some others of you say at a breakup moment. Because um, let's face it, really, it always is you if you're breaking up, right? It's, it's never me, it's always you if it's a breakup. But the series really isn't about that. It's about something a little different. It's more about the heart of Jesus and the heart of Christianity, which is what we'll be looking at in this series. So I say it's not about that, but it, it is about relationships, if you will. Uh, Princess Bride, one of the all-time classic movies for multiple reasons. Uh, the fact that there's no cussing in it makes it so that youth groups around the world can continue to show it, uh, regardless of the age. Um, I remember one of the reviews I read on it says it's a story of a man and woman who lived happily ever after, even though their courtship almost killed them, which I think some of us might be able to identify somewhere along the way if you're in the dating scene right now. Um, but you can't watch a movie like The Princess Bride without being touched by the characters you, you see in it, especially that relationship there at the very beginning. That's the opening scene there with Wesley and Buttercup. Uh, you know, it says that, you know, she... Basically, her whole mission in life was to demean him and to put him down and to treat him horribly. And all he ever would say in return is, as you wish, those classic lines. And we watch that, and there's a, a piece of us that are really drawn to that scene because we so often wish in those moments where somebody demeans us or is rude to us or puts us down, we just wish that we could respond, have the, the strength of character, the kind of humility that could not lash out and not say the things we want to say back, but could simply serve even when we're not being appreciated for our service. You know, we, could, we could simply say, as you wish, and continue to be kind and polite even when somebody is being quite rude towards us. We wish there was a piece of us that could do that, right? And so we see something like that and we go, man, that's, mm, if only I could. But we know in our mind, as much as I want that to be me, that is not me, or at least at the very least, it's not always me. I don't have the strength of character to continue to do it again and again and again if, it was being, if I was being treated like that again and again and again. And so we're drawn to Wesley because we can identify the desire to, to want to be like that. On the other hand, uh, we can also see ourselves in Buttercup. It doesn't matter who you are, guy or girl, you can see yourselves in Buttercup too, right? Uh, that moment where you you wish that somebody, because you know that you have issues. You know that you're not as nice as you should be. You know you're not as kind to the people in your life and in your world as you ought to be. And we all long to be loved unconditionally like that, to have somebody treat us nicely even when we haven't treated them nicely, to, 
to not return every harsh thing that we say back on a harsh word on us. We, we wish that somebody would be patient with us through our issues and through our problems and sort of love us through those difficult seasons of our life. We long to be loved like that. And so we look at this moment, this scene, and we have this desire to, to be like that or to experience something like that. But the, the problem is, is that we know this movie falls into the genre of fairy tale stories as fairy tales. It's that genre of narrative that's all in the realm of fairy tales. And fairy tales always have things in them like, oh, I don't know, magic potions and talking animals and mythical creatures like, oh, I don't know, this one, for instance, has a giant, has a witch, perhaps, and Miracle Max. If you know the movie really well, you'd know it. the witch. I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. Um, sorry. It's a great movie. Um, but there's something in us, though, it reminds us it's a fairy tale. It's not real life. That kind of thing just doesn't happen. We wish it would. We wish it did. We wish we could experience it. We wish we could live like that, but that just, it just doesn't happen. We wish it was possible to be like Wesley, even though we just can't. And we, we wish somebody would be kind to us like that, even though we know it just doesn't happen. And that's why when you read the stories about Jesus, it's sort of hard to comprehend Jesus in the right frame. Now, we know that we're supposed to put the stories of Jesus in a, a literary genre known as historical narrative. In other words, the stories of Jesus, as we're told, are part of history. It's a narrative explaining. Narrative is just simply the story of. Historical narrative being it's the story of something that happened once upon a time in history. So these are things that actually happen. These are true stories. And you read the stories of Jesus, and you see Jesus doing the very same kind of things that Wesley did, loving people in the same way. Uh, rather, the sort of the Bible speak version of as you wish is where Jesus would say, not my will, but yours be done. Is that, isn't that kind of the same thing? Yeah. I would say if you were to do the princess bride version of the Bible when he's in the garden, he would say, as you wish, <laughs> right? And just carry it out. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. Now, you kind of have that, kind of have to keep that in mind as you go and you begin to read. We're going to be looking in Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to be Covering the whole chapter, not necessarily in the proper order, but I'm going to be kind of going through it. And so if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to open it up. If you have a digital device that can get a Bible on it, which all of you have, um, you can open that up and turn to Philippians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible on your phone or other device, uh, go ahead and download one. It's a free uh, version called Version. you can get. It has every translation out there, and you can guess which one I'm using each, each morning because um, I jump around sometimes, but you can follow along as best. Uh, in the middle of Philippians chapter 2, he sort of gives an overview summary of the fairy tale life of Jesus Christ, and he says, "...in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Jesus Christ." who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. And being made in human likeness, he, uh, although being found in the appearance of a man, he became uh, obedient, he, sorry, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I'll come back to that in just a second. Having grown up, most of us having grown up here in America, when you think about religion or what religions ought to be or what, a, what makes for a good religion, typically our minds gravitate towards the idea or at least the evaluating standard of something as a legit, real, uh, honest, true religion. We gravitate towards the idea that if, if a religion is true or good, then it would move somebody or move people or move its followers to want to make the world a better place, to be better people. That sort of the purpose of religion and the course of humanity should be to make people better or make society better, make the world as a whole better in some way, shape, or form. And it's hard to understand how subtly influenced you are by Christianity and the message of Jesus uh, without even knowing it. Because if you really kind of just step out aside yourself for just a minute and you look around the world, it's not the, that way everywhere else in the world. And I can easily prove that to you by talking about what happens around the world when people take their religion seriously. We might call them religious extremists or go to the extreme ends of where their religion takes them. And where does that take people in this world? It takes them to sort of magnify and glorify the worst elements of human nature, doesn't it? 
you know, to go down paths of violence and go down paths of destruction. And there are people in this world who have convinced themselves that because of their great devotion to what they believe is God or their great devotion to their religious ideals, they'll go and blow themselves up on somebody. They'll go and destroy a complete society or a village simply because they believe that is what their religion has led them to do. Even other religions that may not make the headlines for being so violent, that look a little bit more peaceful or calm, it's interesting how we don't even realize that it was the harshness of the faiths that were practiced in India that made Mother Teresa stand out so well. You know, Mother Teresa was one who went and just simply loved people on the street, loved the orphans and loved the children that everybody else had forgotten about. Because what we often maybe overlook is the fact that the religions of India uh, sort of either justified or encouraged the idea or the notion that there are certain people you don't have to care for. There are certain people that just don't matter. Uh, their existence is completely irrelevant. And it was against that kind of backdrop and such a great contrast that Mother Teresa, who comes in emulating the life of Christ, looks and says, no, every soul is precious. And she gives her life and uh, gives her heart to serve those who nobody else cares for, to love the unlovable, or as they would call them, the untouchables or uh, those who are, are unclean in their society. And so it was because of that great contrast that Mother Teresa stands out so amazingly. It's that same kind of thing you see, that contrast you see in Jesus' life is, is re- well stated in John chapter 13. Maybe John chapter 13 and stories like that are what Paul has in mind when he's writing Philippians 2 and that sort of recap of, of Jesus' life. In, Philipp- in John chapter 13, the setting in John 13 is they're at the Last Supper, They've all just sat down, and John makes this note as he's writing the story in in verse 3. He says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he'd come from God and he was returning to God. Now, if if you didn't know anything else about Jesus, and all you knew is that you have a guy who knows he has all power invested in him, and he is God, and he's going back to become one with God again, that is sort of a license to do whatever you want to do, is it not? I know that the lottery is getting up close to a billion dollars right now, both of them combined. Um, I'll tell you why he's not going to let you win, (laughs) because you can't handle that kind of power. I mean, the closest thing to absolute power in our society is that kind of money, right? With that kind of money, you can buy whatever power, authority, or influence you want to buy, right? And as much as you really want to win, if all authority and power was given to you, what would you do with it? probably the opposite of what you're about to read with Jesus. So right after it says, he knew all authority and all power had been given to him, the next verse is, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist, and did the most demeaning job that nobody in that room thought was uh, their place to do. It was, all, it was beneath everybody else in the room. So in other words, the job that everybody else felt was beneath him because he says all power and authority has been given to him. So what does he do? He gets up and he takes on the very nature of a servant. He wraps a towel around his waist and he washes the feet. And by washing the feet, you're washing off the dirt and the dust of the day as well as the animal droppings or whatever else your feet may have picked up walking on the dirty roads. And yes, animal droppings is a real thing. Even to this day in Israel, if you walk down the streets, there are herds of sheep walking down the street on any given day of the week. We experienced that when we were over there. There's traffic going on and you just stop traffic because, you know, there's a herd of sheep going through. It's, it's their municipal lawn mowing facilities. They just go around. The lawn mowers go everywhere. And all grass is fair game. doesn't matter where it's at in the city. It's all fair game. Nobody has a lawn mower. They just rove around, you know, roaming herds of lawn mowers. Just rove around and take it. Um, so that's what he gets down to wash off uh, their feet. He does that very thing. And I think that's what Paul sort of is summarizing here, here when he says, being in the very nature of God, he did not consider, you know, his his godness as something that he wanted to gloat over everybody or show everybody or something to promote and say, if you want to become like God, be like me and be all authoritative and all powerful and lord it over everyone because that's what I want you to emulate. No, it says being in the very nature of God, he humbled himself and became a servant. You see that expressed so well there in that moment when he's washing everybody's feet, including the feet of the one who was about to betray him with a kiss. That was the nature of Jesus as you read through the story, and you think about Jesus and all the other stuff he did. He loved those who were unlovable. He loved those who were the outcasts of the society. Uh, he was the Mother Teresa of his day, if you will. That seems almost like a paradoxical way to ex- describe him. I'm taking somebody you know, Lord, though, and, and explaining to somebody maybe you haven't seen. Uh, he loved the unlovable. 
he was patient with those who were trying to trap him and trying to always look for a way to accuse them. If you think about the patience that he shows and his responses to them, or the very fact that he would look at the soldiers who are simply carrying out orders to kill him, and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They, they're just carrying out orders. God, take that into account when, when one day they realize they've crucified the, the very hands that have created them. You know, just, just, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You just think about that nature and that heart, and it's, it's amazing to think that that is who Jesus was, and that's what he did. But what's also incredible about the story is the little verse in Philippians that I, we just kind of sped over to get to the Jesus stuff. In verse 5, he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. You know, you watch a movie like The Princess Bride, and however much you might identify with Wesley in the movie, however much you, you may look and go, oh, no, oh, that's so good. Oh, oh, if only you could have that kind of a relationship. Oh, that'd be great. Nobody walks out of the theater thinking to themselves, you know, I'm going to go be like Wesley. You know, if I, when I think about my wife, she's more like Buttercup than anybody else I know. I'm going to be a Wesley to her. We don't think that, do we? We don't, right? No. Be easy there with your application right now. Uh, we don't think the way, that way. We don't you know, automatically think, you know, whenever somebody treats me like Buttercup, I'm going to act like Wesley from now on. I watched that movie, I'm so inspired. But the amazing thing about Jesus Christ is that what you see time and time again is that the people who come in contact with his story, his life, what he did, they walk away not as a critic thinking about what they thought of his life. They walk away the more they get to know him, truly wanting to be like him and emulate him. And Paul fully expects that that is the reality of anybody who gets to know the story of Jesus Christ better will begin to emulate it more and more and more. To the extent to which you know Jesus is the extent to which you become like him and you act like him in your life. And that's just not true with the fairy tales we watch. We've watched hundreds of them. We've read hundreds of them over the course of our life. But we don't ever walk away going, I'm going to be that. But the thing about Jesus Christ, what's so amazing about him is that's who he is. That's who he was. And it's amazing that he makes us like that. And he'll go on in this chapter, and he says this in uh, chapter 12, right after it. He says, or sorry, chapter 2, verse 12. He says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And what he's saying there is, is yes, God is at work in your life to make you more like Jesus Christ. Yes, he saved you. Yes, he, it comes into your life, but he doesn't just enter into your life so you can have eternal relationship with him. He enters into your life so that you can become more and more and more like him, that you can love one day like Jesus loved, or maybe to put it in your own terms, maybe something you might be more familiar with, that you might love someone the way Wesley loved Buttercup. You would continually to sacrificially, humbly lay down your life for someone else and show that kind of love and that kind of service towards someone, that God actually will move you to that, that you might continue to work out your salvation, take what he's put in you, and can you to work that out throughout your life. And as Paul is talking about this, and he's talking about who Jesus is, what's interesting as you follow along his train of thought, he moves right to somebody who's sort of acting this out or an example of this. And so he moves right into, in verse 19, uh, two guys, Timothy and Epaphroditus. So we'll start with the first one. Verse 19, he says, I hope to be able to send Timothy to you soon, that you might be cheered when I receive, that I might be cheered when I receive news about you. He says, For I have no one else like him who will show genuine concerns for your interests. For everybody looks out for their own interests, rather than the things of Jesus Christ and the things that he showed concern for. So just pause there for a second. He says, You know, there's nobody else like Timothy. Timothy cares about other people's interests, you know, more than himself. Uh, the same kind of thing that Jesus did, you see that in Timothy. In other words, he's a walking, talking, living example of what Jesus Christ was like. And I really hope I can send him to you so you can live and see that example. I hope you could see sort of that Wesley moment in action in your own life. Now, <clears throat> before you kind of run down this path and begin to think that Timothy's some kind of spiritual superhero, that he's this, you know, wow, Timothy, if I was be like a Timothy, like a Jesus, you got to read the rest of the story in the Bible to learn a little bit more about Timothy's background. It, Later on, Paul will send Timothy out. Timothy will go out by himself and minister in some very difficult experiences. Paul will write him two letters. They're the, later on in the Bible, you'll see 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are letters that Paul writes to Timothy later on. And we, from those letters, we can pick up a few things about Timothy. Uh, in the first letter he writes to Timothy, uh, he says, hey, um, I know you got a lot of stomach issues. Take something for that. Don't neglect it. You know, you know, you got to deal with that stuff. You know, I, I want you to get healthy. 
Uh, and then in the second letter, he writes to him, he says, listen, I know your name is Timothy, but don't act like your name sort of implies. Don't be as timid as Timothy would sound. Rather, fan the flame of, of the boldness for the gospel that I know that is in you. I know it's there, that, that it might get outside of you, that you would uh, be strong and courageous, that you wouldn't live out a timid life. So all that to say, what do we know then about Timothy? He's a sickly boy who has a lot of anxiety. And that's it. And that's who Paul says, I really wish I could send you this sickly boy with a lot of anxiety. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for that. Why would you send that guy to me? Because there's no one else like him. There's no one else like him that despite his own issues, despite his anxieties, despite his health issues, what does it say about Timothy? There's nobody else like him. With all the stuff he's got going against him, he genuinely cares for the needs of other people. He genuinely cares, cares about the things that Jesus Christ cares for, namely you, your health, your well-being, what's going on in your life. And that sort of addresses one of the, or the, the two main reasons why a lot of us don't serve. Uh, one is our own anxieties and fears. We all have this idea that, well, I, I could never do that. I, I don't think I could, I could ever you know, serve in that capacity, go and do that. I don't know. I just don't think I'm ready for that. I think, I think maybe you know, down the road when I'm in a better place, when I'm you know, more healthy, then I'll be able to do something like that. No, no, no. There's also this idea out there that there's some people who deal with anxiety and fear. There's other people who are just by their very nature courageous. The reality is everybody has fear. We, we, a couple years ago, we did a whole series on this about fear. Everybody has fear. It's just that some people overcome their fears and work through them, and some people give in to them and are confined by them. That's it. Everybody has a sense of fear. If you don't have any fear, you're not alive. There, there's, there's something that, that is terrifying to everybody. The difference is some people walk in and face their fears, and other people let them get the best of you. For Timothy, his fears and his anxiety ultimately didn't stop him from carrying out the mission that God gave him. And then on the other hand, you say, some people say, well, I just need to focus on me for a season. I'm not, you know, I, this is a, a season where I focus on me, and then later when I'm healthier, then I'll be in a place I can help other people. Now, there is an element of truth to that. I would highly encourage you, if you have some emotional distress and problems, don't try to help other people in their emotional stress until you've dealt with your own emotions, right? However, while you're going through some of your own emotional health and issues, or your own emotional traumas, that doesn't mean you can't sweep the floor for somebody doesn't mean you can't pick up, you know, pick up after somebody or help somebody or care for somebody. There's a lot of serving you can do. Oftentimes what you'll find is that you can serve your way through a lot of your own pain, discomfort, and distress. Just the very natural high that you'll get from being of use and of service and of help to somebody else oftentimes will be the very thing that fuels you through that experience. When you people go through a period of mourning or grief, uh, there, there's a season there where you, you just shut down for a while. But everybody will tell you at some point, you've got to get back up on the horse. At some point, you've got to get back out there. At some point, you've got to re-engage life again. And one of the best ways to do that is to get back in the saddle and begin to serve again. You know, even when you're not fully there, you're not fully conscious and not even fully wanting to be there, you just have to get out there and to begin to do it again. And you'll find that's what helps fuel you through that difficult season in your life is just getting back out there and being of use and finding a purpose once again through serving. And so Paul says, I've got nobody else like him. I've got Timothy. There's nobody else like him. And later on uh, in, this, or in this passage or somewhere in here, he, I say somewhere in here, um, it's in verse 14. He says, do nothing without grumbling or arguing. He says that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then you will shine like stars in the sky. That's what Mother Teresa was doing in India. You know, in the darkness of the religion of that community, she shined like a star in a dark night. And the, and the star is what you see. It's something that contrasts all the darkness around it. And when you have a genuine concern for everybody else, this is what he says in there. You know, he says, everybody else looks out for their own interests. That's just our nature. We're always looking out for number one. I mean, it's, we read something, it's not me, it's you. No, 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 no. It's not you, it's me. I'm always concerned about me. I'm always looking out for number one. Nobody has to tell me to do that. That's just how our, how our life works. You know, our mottos in life are, I'll show you respect when... You start to show me respect. We can finish that without even you know, any practice right there. It's like, where do we learn all of these things? You know, you scratch you know, my back and I'll scratch yours. That's, that's the way we work. You do something for me, I'll do something for you. The whole concept of the Buttercup Wesley relationship, that is foreign to us. That is not our life. That is not our world. You treat me like Buttercup, hit the road. No, 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 no. You don't have any time for that. You know, don't, don't wait around if somebody's going to treat you like that. You, and in the midst of that, he says, there's nobody else like Timothy. He's not just looking out for you know, his own stuff. He's always looking out for everybody else. Now, he's a living example of what he was exhorting them to do. If you go back to the very beginning of this chapter, that's exactly what he's calling on them to do. The, the teaching he has at the very beginning of the chapter 
um, is back in verse, somewhere in my notes it's in there. Screw it, I'll just quote it. Did I just say that? Anyways, um, <laughs> uh, he says back in verse 3, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility look out for the needs of others or put the other needs of others before your own needs or before you look to your own needs. He says, look out for other people's interests. And later on, he says, this is what Jesus Christ did. This is what Jesus Christ inspires us to do. This is what you can see in live action Timothy doing. And unlike that, there's this other guy, Epaphroditus. He came from your congregation. He was sent to me. You guys sent him here to care for me. And also, by the way, there's a little subtext going on underneath all of this. And that is the guy writing the letter and where he's writing it from. If you know the book of Philippians, you'll know that Paul is writing this from a Roman prison where he's facing a possible execution before Caesar. Uh, He doesn't know how it's going to turn out. He's on death row of his day. And when you were in a Roman prison, it wasn't like our modern prisons. There was no sense to care for your welfare. As a matter of fact, if by neglect and starvation, you died in prison, well, that just, you know, clears out the court docket for somebody else. We can get a lot, you know, we can get through the court docket a lot quicker if more of y'all would just die in prison, and we're quite okay if that happens, because you have no responsibilities, and we have no obligation to care for you while you're in prison. That was Rome's philosophy, and so the only way you'd be cared for having anything to eat is if somebody were to come in and to help you or care for you during that time, and so the Philippian church, you know, a guy from there named Epaphroditus came to help Paul on his way there, making the perilous journey 800, 800 some miles through the ancient world. He ends up getting sick along the way, almost dies. And so Paul's writing about this and he says, you know, Epaphroditus, he's going to be coming back to you. You know, thank you guys so much for sending him. Um, he says, you guys heard he was ill and I want you to know he's okay. Um, he says he was ill, he almost died, uh, but God had mercy on him. Uh, but not only him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Like, I would have felt horrible if he came here to help me and then he died along the way. Um, and so he says, uh, welcome him to the Lord with great joy and honor, people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And so he says, this is another great example of somebody who was willing to lay down his life for the love of somebody else. You know, somebody who truly has a loving relationship with Jesus Christ, the closer you get with Jesus, the more like Jesus you'll become and the more servant-like you'll become. The truest way to know somebody truly has a loving relationship with Jesus and understands the kind of love that Jesus has is they become like him. Spoiler alert for the movie of Princess Bride. Like I say, once it's been past 10, 20 years, I don't care if you give away some of the plot. The question throughout the first part of that movie, through an inconceivable series of events, is Wesley is wondering, does Buttercup really know him? Does she really love him in return? And he's wondering that very thing. So you see in, the, in that opening scene that she seems like as if she's moved, and he begins to think that maybe she's so moved by his love for her. And the question that sort of you know, comes throughout the very first part of that movie is, do you really love me? Do you really understand the love I have for you? And has that so moved you to have that same kind of love for me? Do you? And that's why the whole movie is about true love, right? And that's one of the questions, sort of the undercurrent of everything with you and Jesus, is do you truly understand the love of Jesus? Do you truly embrace who he is? Because if you did, at some point, you wouldn't continue to be like Buttercup is in that first first scene. Your heart would move and change to become more and more and more the way Wesley is in that opening scene. Because to know Jesus and fully have a relationship with him, it will move you and it will change you. And if you haven't been moved or you haven't been changed, then you don't really know him. And that's the question, of course, he has when he meets her again later on in the movie. He's like, you know, do you really change? Has it really had any impact on you at all? Other thing about Epaphroditus you have to know is uh, his name, Epaphroditus. It is the male version of Aphrodite. So Epaphroditus, Epaphrodite, Aphrodite. So it's the male version. We have like male, female version, like Stephen, Stephanie, Michelle, Michael. It's like the female version of the the other name or a male version of the name. So is it fair to say probably that he didn't grow up in what we would call a Christian home? Is it fair to say he didn't grow up living out and being like Jesus Christ? That's probably not the values he was taught as a kid. And yet we have this idea that there are some people, well, you were just raised that way. That's just how you were born. No, 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 no. People aren't just born like Jesus Christ. We're born more like Buttercup than anything else. You have to choose to become like a Wesley. You have to choose to become like Jesus Christ. You have to choose to immerse yourself in a relationship with Jesus Christ that you might become like him in the process. Nobody's just born that way or becomes that way accidentally. It is a choice that you make along the way. So as we finish out this morning, I don't want you to walk away from this morning's message the way you walk away from watching a movie about a fairy tale. 
See, when you watch a movie like Princess Bride, you walk out of the theaters and you talk, oh, that was a good movie. You like that? That was a good movie. Yeah. I don't know much about that. I don't know about that. And you, you evaluate sort of the characters and how they were, but there's no thought in your mind that it would impact how you live or what you do. The whole purpose for coming in contact with the Word of God is that it might change you as a result of it, that the difference between a fairy tale and the historical reality of Jesus Christ is that a fairy tale may leave you inspired, it may leave you endeared, but it doesn't change you. The whole purpose of the Scriptures is that you might never be the same again once you come in contact with the love of Jesus Christ. And so my hope is that you would begin to work that out in your life. And so I want to give you an assignment as we prepare ourselves for Easter, which is coming up just here two weeks away is that you would look for a Wesley moment every day over the next seven days. You'd look for an opportunity to, you know, in your own mind, you don't have to say it out loud, but in your mind, respond with as you wish, rather than as every fiber in your body wants to respond in that moment. Right? When somebody may, if that means if somebody were to be rude to you or demean you or ask of something of you, that you might respond in the kind of loving, kind, caring way that we would see through Jesus Christ. That you might look for those Wesley moments. Um, maybe that means serving somebody uh, that you're not supposed to be serving. Uh, that you would help somebody that maybe doesn't deserve to be helped. That you'd return kindness to somebody who hasn't been kind to you. That you would look for just those opportunities throughout the days. Uh, maybe for some of you, it might be to overcome a fear you have to help somebody or to serve somebody like Timothy overcame his fear. Maybe for some of you, you know, it's a moment where you're thinking, well, I'm not in a place to help anybody right now. Okay, stop that thinking, move to a place of Timothy and go, okay, where is it that I could help even just in a small way before I even think I'm ready to? That you might look for each day for a Wesley moment of as you wish. Um, would you want me to close our time in prayer? Father, I thank you for your grace over us because this is so hard. It'd be very easy right now for us to play our highlight reel in our mind of all the times where we did this right, where we got this down, where we showed love even when someone didn't deserve it. But the reality, Father, is that is not our everyday experience and that is not exactly what makes up our ethos. What's amazing about Timothy and Epaphroditus is when Paul is thinking about Jesus, these two guys immediately come to his mind. Father, may our life and life's ambition be that when somebody is thinking about Jesus Christ or trying to explain who Jesus is, that we would come to their mind. That our ability to love when we're unloved, that our ability to be kind when we're treated harshly, our ability, Father, to show humility in the face of disrespect might be the very thing that helps somebody understand who Jesus was and what he did. That our life, our life might be an example of the change that can come about by com becoming in contact with you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.